Perfect. I think we saw it. Cool. All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to Meet the Hot Text. Um, so this meetup has been in existence for four years now, and this is the first time I have an introduction slide deck. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that. Uh, <laughs> meetup of test. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank Ergon. They have been uh, year-long friends of meetup of test and always uh, offer their venue to have this meetup, which is absolutely great. Uh, meetups are for free, but they couldn't happen if there were not great companies like Ergon. Uh, offering their venue to hold these sort of meetups, and they're also very generous in uh, offering beer for you and some chips and snacks, which is uh, absolutely uh, best thing. So they are really our uh, best friend. Uh, oops, you want to take a picture, please? Yes. Thank you. There you go. So uh, there's a Wi-Fi in here. So if you need Wi-Fi connection, um, it's called Weekly Special. Uh, that's the number. Um, don't save this network because the password will change every. I think five minutes or so. No, I think every every week the password changes anyway. Um, cool. So um, your host, that's me. My name is Vitali, uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a humanist. That's what I am. Uh, I like people. It's, uh, I'm I'm a person myself. So quite naturally, I like I like humans. Humans are cool. Good. So um, this meetup um, talks on all sorts of uh, testing related stuff, but I think that's that's a theme that uh, this could be summarized under. So it's gonna be even a joy to kill bad ideas uh, by presenting better ideas. Uh, so tonight we'll have uh, Robert Severin, I'm going to introduce him later on. Uh, we'll have a testing in the park in uh, next week. Um, it's already, well, sold out. Um, whereby sold doesn't mean uh, anything because it doesn't cost anything. Uh, but still, if you think you want to show up, uh, just show up. Meetups usually have a show up rate of 60% of people that register. So currently there are 14 people and there's space for 12. So if you think uh, like it would be a good idea to have a beer uh, in the Ale House next week um, on Thursday, then just show up. I think uh, there's always space to come with you. Cool. Uh, so what do we do? So in general, there are we have shit expensive yet awesome stuff. Uh, what we do? So this house of tests where we. Um, people into projects. Then we have Rebels of IT. That's the reason why Rob Saab is in, in Zurich uh, holding workshops. So these are paid for courses. They're uh, very expensive, but they're, they're just awesome, uh, especially because we have people like Rob Saab. Uh, but because we also believe in community work, we do a lot of uh, events like this one here, uh, which will always be for free. And we, uh, the way I do it with people who give workshops, um, I always uh, invite them to come to the meetup, and they're usually very happy to do that, so that there's something for the community. Then, just recently, I opened a, um, a, a Slack uh, instance, uh, Slack of um, Slack of test. Uh, this is something that you can join if you want to join that. Um, just give me your, your business card or your email address, and I can send you the invite for that. Um, it should be something that's Switzerland-centric in terms of uh, discussions about testing. Something that gives you the chance to have rapid conversations with uh, with other people uh, and kind of building a community. So that's what we want to do. And we also have a mailing list. Uh, where we spam people. So if you like spam, uh, also give me your email address and I'll, I'll spam you. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Good. So for these uh, events, I'll just enjoy the event. That's the first rule here. Then uh, interact with each other, especially after the talk is finished. And also interact with Rob, ask him questions. Uh, he loves to do that. And uh, basically, that's that's all there is. So I would like to introduce uh, Rob Severin. He is a professor of software engineering at McGill University in Canada, and he runs a testing consultancy. So uh, he lives in the um, in the ivory tower, uh, but climbs down to go to the weeds with real companies, uh, and has been doing that for uh, we established eighty seven years. Was that since eighteen hundred something? Two millennia. Two, yeah, since since very long. So he's been doing that, um, and. Yeah, so I'll pass the word on to you. And let's switch again to your laptop. But I'm getting comfortable over here. <laughs> Isn't that cool? There's a comfortable chair here with its own tree. <laughs> chair, tree. Ellery, it's a tree. It's not a human. Well, I think it's a plastic. It's made out of plastic. <laughs> oh, okay. It's a human generated tree. And I have water here. I. I'm very happy to speak at meetups and small community groups. And whenever I travel, I always look for them and find them. 
sometimes at universities, sometimes at companies like this, and very often at clubs and bars all, all around the world. It's a fun thing to share my experiences, but I realize now, uh, when I heard the beautiful, thank you for the beautiful introduction, Hillary, I realized that I gave a talk in this very room last November. Right? How many people were there in November? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. So I have two problems now. I don't remember what I said then, <laughs> and I'm afraid I might be repetitive in my examples. I, I, I fear that I'm going to be repetitive in my examples. If I am repetitive in my examples, remember that we can draw many lessons from the same case study, and I apologize in advance. This, this talk is getting a lot of interesting energy. <laughs> I'm asked to give it more and more. I just got yesterday called by people who run a conference called Eurostar to turn it into a webinar in September sometime. So I don't know where people get the idea that it's a fun talk, but everyone who attends it tell me it's, it's interesting and fun. I did it last week in the Reno Nevada, no, in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I had 75 people there, and they were at a, a hotel called Caesar's Palace. You ever hear of Caesar's Palace? So if you can imagine, they have a choice. There's the pool outside where there's basically all these people who are not wearing very much clothes, and they're all drinking very fancy drinks, or there's roulette, uh, there's casino games, there's poker, there's the machines, or there's my talk. <laughs> and 70 people have very poor judgment. <laughs> they, just, they came to my talk. Uh, it's a compelling topic, uh, mostly because it has the word driven in it. So why do I have the word driven in the talk? What is it? Because everybody's got the word driven in their talk, and Rob Sab needs driven in his talk? I don't know. You've heard of test-driven development? Have you heard of acceptance test-driven development, behavior-driven development, risk-driven testing, charter-driven testing, all sorts of drivens. Everyone's got an acronym with driven. But the one driven I've never seen before is the one driven that bothers me the most. It's the one driven that I'm praying we do more of. It's reality-driven stuff. I am deeply concerned. I go to customer after customer in companies, in IT, in product development, in infrastructure software, in banks, in insurance companies, in telecommunication companies, all over the freaking place. And I look at the testing they're trying to do in agile sprints. How many people do some scrummish thing here? Some of you? So how much can that? Some of you? Extreme programming? Reality driven development? Waterfall? Waterfall, everything. You got you raise your for every single one. That's good. So, so imagine you're testing on a project, and you're busy. You're busy. You have no time. It's a two-week sprint, and the developers give you the code to test. You know, after seven days, and and, and what are you going to do? Don't tell me this doesn't happen. It happens all the time. No matter how well organized you are, you're crunched. You have no time. So, what are you testing? You go and you look at the story, and you say, okay, let's take the story and confirm that they implemented the story. You don't go and validate that the story is what the customer really needs, but you go and say, did the developers program the story? That's okay, that's good. Someone else was responsible for making sure that story was important. I just tell you it was implemented. And then for testing, well, I gotta do some, some other testing. Let me take the acceptance criteria for the story, and let me turn those into tests. So I've got, the story tests, which is cool. If you know the story tests, like written to confirm that the requirements meet the customer's real needs. It's, it's a nice thing. It's part of the requirements of Agile teams. And people rush like mad, and they try to automate these. So they work very, very hard, not just to, just to implement them, but to automate them in that three days that you have with no, no time to do anything. They're busy figuring out how to use Gherkin with Cucumber, with step definitions, with JBehave, all that together. In, a, in an IDE they don't really understand, and they get it all up and running, and all of the sweat equity, all of the energy that they've expended, is really smithing the tool, tool smithing. It's not really learning about risks. 
And for me, testing is, is, I hope, learning about risks to help make important decisions about products, about technology, about life, about everything. And what are we doing These, in Agile Sprints? We're doing sweat, we're, so we're working, we're doing some work, but I don't know if you studied physics. When I studied physics in school, I, I was told that work involves motion. <laughs> and if there's no motion, <laughs> You're not really doing work. Even if you sweat a lot, it's not real work. And I like to believe that a lot of what's done in Agile Sprints is preparing for regression testing against something that's like a fantasy. It's a fantasy. It's a belief I have that what was required is what's needed, and what was coded is what should have been coded. And then you might say, well, we also Shift left, you've heard of shift left, shift left, shift left. We all do the shifting left, and we have the programmers. If you go far enough left, you actually get the programmers. And the programmers are very wonderful people, and they're good and kind, and they're members of the team, and they know they have skills, and they apply those skills to do a lot, a lot, a lot of unit testing. Tons of beautiful, gorgeous unit testing. You see, for every story, sometimes you have 100, 200, gorgeous, right? You see that every time, right? No? You don't see that every time? Have you ever seen it? Of course you've seen it. You, see, you write them, yes, so there you go. So they have these tests. And the unit tests invariably are written by the programmer to exercise the code to make sure that it has you know, strong structural integrity as code. These are low-level tests. They're usually uh, very helpful for robustness concerns and, and to make sure that the little bits that we're building glue together very well. But they're not transactional tests. They're, they're not business facing. They're, they're what they call technology facing tests. And very often these are very good tests, but they don't replace questions about does the product really do what real people really necessarily need it to do. In fact, I've had customers that do lots of unit testing that demonstrate that the code does what it was programmed to do. You're laughing because you understand the humor in that statement. You, you, prove, you prove that the code does what it was programmed to do, and therefore you're testing the compiler. You're just making sure the Java compiler worked, or the, or, or the C-sharp compiler worked. Because all you're doing is you're saying, if you coded this, does that code match what the compiler thinks it is? And yes, you have perfect code because it, it compiled well, not because it does what it's supposed to do. And I'm not saying developers are bad about that, but the reality is that if you look at a lot of unit testing, it, it's structural integrity, beautiful, beautiful structural stuff. But it, in terms of confirming, does the code match the design? Does the design match the story? Does the story meet the need? You really don't have that chain. You don't have that chain. And with only three days <laughs> left, and by the way, there's five other stories going on at the same time, you don't really have a lot of time to do it. So I am mad as hell that people who are working in Agile teams do not consider reality when they're testing. And I think if they would just step back a little bit, and maybe a little more, and look with a bigger perspective, that they're gonna come up with great testing opportunities based on things that really matter, that will find bugs that are influential, and maybe, not waste your time building an automated regression test that doesn't prove anything, but runs automatically very nicely. And instead have a test that maybe is not necessarily fully automated, but it does something of incredible value to your organization. So this is where I got into this reality stuff. And there's actually one slide with three bullets of text on it that explains everything. Everything else is just raw gap gap gabbing and telling stories to try to make a point of this. So when we get to the key slide, I will tell you this is the key slide. You can read it, and then you can go home. <laughs> so before that, you know me. If you want interesting information about the subject, articles, uh, copies of this material, any questions, always feel free to email me. I'll be delighted to share with you electronic copies of anything I show you or share with you, including articles about the stuff I'm talking about. Glad to do it. Usually I share this with Dropbox technology if you're Dropbox users, I don't know if Dropbox is popular in this market, but if you want, just send me an email, remind me, 
reality-driven testing, or send one to Hillary. He has the access to all this stuff. All right, me, picture, yay, uh, philosophy, important. First of all, we're here because of a pain point, right? We're here because we know that we are not able to always find important problems in the short amount of time we're given. And we're so focused on things <coughs> that are coverage notions that it's scary. Today, I see the tool vendors for development tools, IDEs and mocking frameworks, focusing on dashboards that talk about coverage. And the tools are getting very, very good. I'm not gonna say they're bad. They're very good at telling you about code coverage of your automated tests. Your automated story tests, your automated unit tests. They're gonna tell you all about code coverage. And these are great things. And you look at the dashboards, and you like, it's like you're driving a 1957 car. Do you want me to just ignore you? Out of the room. Okay, now what was I thinking about? Oh, yes, the car. A 1957 Corvette. And if you look at the Corvette dashboard, you can see the steering wheel. The whole dashboard is inside of the steering wheel. It's a beautiful, beautiful dashboard. And what they're creating are these gorgeous dashboards. And these gorgeous dashboards help build confidence to our stakeholders. As the stakeholders see this, and they see things like, like numbers, like, whoa, you've got 93.2% code coverage, or 72% or branch coverage. And you can see, if you add a story, the numbers change, and the dashboard just runs, and you're driving your car, and it's all fast and fantastic, and everything is good, and these dashboards are obviously making it better to develop software. Well, maybe you should stop for a minute and look at some bugs. And maybe you should stop and talk to programmers you work with. And if you are a programmer, talk to your peers. And ask your peers to tell you a story. Tell me the story of the last five bugs that you fixed. Tell me the story of the last five bugs that were found in production that you had to fix. What did you do to fix them? I do this all the time. Last year, 400 developers were interviewed systematically by my McGill students on questions like this. In almost 100% of the cases, the programmer had to add conditions or code that weren't considered when the code was originally written. In almost 100% of the cases, the developers had to add something that was not there. How can a code coverage tool tell you what percentage of what's not there you've covered? They can only talk to you about what's there, not about what's not there. You will never have any feeling or sensitivity of a bug of omission when you look at those coverage monitors, and yet almost every bug that escapes to production is something that was missing. And it's not the fault of the programmers. I'm not blaming the programmers. I just want to tell you, it's not because they, they had a syntax error on line 37 and they switched the order of the parameters. It's because there was a logical concept that wasn't there, and they had to have a little code before or after line 37 that wasn't there. And so that code coverage before and after was 100% both sides. It, it, the code coverage tells you absolutely nothing about bugs of omission, and almost all bugs are bugs of omission. So I love the fallacy of code coverage. Code coverage is nice. What code coverage tells me is what I'm not testing, and that's beautiful. It'll say, hey, Rob, see all this code here? You're testing that, but you're not testing this code over here. Then I can look and say, well, maybe I should add some tests over here. But it doesn't tell me how good I test the stuff over here. So we have now a whole industry that is basically suffering from dashboard IDE pain and they don't really see the pain. They're spending money on them, and the tools are good. The dashboards are accurate, and what I love about the modern dashboards is they correlate the build, they correlate the, the testing, they correlate, correlate the unit tests and the, and the story tests, they correlate the check-ins, and they correlate that to the stories. So you have a story, a check-in, the, the, the requirement, the code, the tests, and the unit tests all correlate by these tools, and it's very automatic, it's very transparent, it's built right in, transparently into IDEs, it's beautiful, beautiful technology.
but it still doesn't necessarily tell you anything about the quality of what you're doing. And so we have pain. Uh, a lot of our testing is, is geared towards um, reasons that have to do with readiness. The question is, are we ready? Are we ready to ship this? In Agile teams, you will say, is the story done? You've heard the expression, is the story done? No? This, maybe it's just a Canadian expression. <laughs> I don't know. Done. I go to customers all the time. And I hear, well, it's done, but it's not done, done. <laughs> or, well, it's done, done, but not done, done, done. <laughs> well, it's done, 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 but not done, 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 done. <laughs> okay, we have a checklist somewhere. All the entries have to be done. And if it says done seven times, it's done seven times. That's nice, it's consistent. What we're doing in testing is helping people understand, is it done? Are we finished? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? That's the type of question we're trying to answer. We're trying to learn about this. And when we're asked questions about this, we're hopefully, in the world of testing, concerned about issues related to quality. I hope. I don't know. Maybe we're not worried about quality. Maybe we're, we are worried about coverage of code and not worried about does the software do something useful or does it well. Uh, a lot of people who are in the software testing business used to have job titles or job descriptions which had words like quality in them. I am a software quality engineer. I am a quality control analyst. I am a SQA person. This was, this was common. Today, I don't know if you have that. Some people, they call themselves testers. Some people call themselves quality engineers. It's still, it's still there. If we care about quality, one of the most important reality checks you gotta do, reality check, before you start your agile sprint, learn what quality means. And it's not quality to Robert Sabran that matters. It's quality to your important stakeholders that matter. And there's many views of quality, many, many views of quality. And I believe I talked about this during my last talk here, that if you have a different view of quality, you can have dramatically different testing. So first reality point is get in sync on quality. There's a bunch of different views uh, of view. One view is quality is a conformance to requirements. That's a view. It's not good or bad, it's a view. Then there's a view that says quality is fitness for use. That's a view, again, I'm not gonna say any is good or bad. And there's another view that quality is value to some person. That's a view too. And there's about 13 other views of quality, which are all different. And your stakeholder, your product owner, your customer may have a different opinion of it. And when I'm testing, I want to learn about issues of quality that matter to my stakeholders. Not that is my personal opinion. I've had stakeholders that are fanatic about spelling mistakes. They care so much about spelling mistakes that if there's one spelling mistake on a report, they, they don't want to pay for the whole project. Fanatical. So for them, <laughs> we put a lot of energy on spelling checkers. You know? uh, otherwise, I would say the best way to learn from your stakeholders what quality is is to watch them make difficult decisions. And difficult decisions happen in agile teams when you're forced to say go, no go, based on a piece of software that has a known bug in it. So imagine you have a story and it's flaky, there's a problem with it. And you, you feel you don't have time in the sprint to resolve that problem. And because you're using Scrum, you have this time box notion you have to fit it, fix it by Friday at 2 or else it's too late. So you get the product owner in, you show them the bug, and you tell them, well, if we don't do this, the story is not going to be good, it's not going to be finished in the sprint. And the product owner might tell you, well, that's okay, leave it in there, we can live with that. Or they might tell you, no, pull that story, pull it out, we're not going to ship that. And what, are they, what is the product owner telling you? They're telling you what they think about quality. And these are the tough decisions. It's not the slang, it's not the slogan, it's not the words written on the poster. It's the decisions people make. As someone involved in an Agile team, if you wanna focus on reality testing, watch tough decisions. 
take notes about tough decisions. In your retrospective, discuss tough decisions. Because the more you know about these tough, tough, tough decisions, the more you know about what quality is. And you will focus and rebalance your work so that you focus your testing on things that fit what matters and don't waste your time on things that don't matter. Now, I'm not saying we don't, if we see a bug, we don't report it. If you see a bug, bring it to the team, show it to everybody. But some bugs, you don't bother looking for. You know, if people are always saying there's a browser incompatibility, uh, don't worry about that as long as it works on a certain browser, we're okay. If it doesn't work on another browser, we'll make an update release. Okay, so I won't bother doing too much testing on that other browser, maybe a little bit, but not too much. And if I find a bug, I'll report it, but I'm not gonna look for the bug. I'm not gonna look for the weird platform incompatibility. If conformance to requirements is what matters, I will hunt for implicit requirements, because not all requirements are written down. If suitability to purpose is what matters, I'm gonna to try to model what the user's job is instead of what the software does. Suitability to purpose, does the software let the do user do what they need? To test that, you model what the user does, not necessarily what the software does. It's a totally different type of testing, just by a different view of quality. And value to stakeholders, is the type of definition of quality where you say every single story has different stakeholders who value different things. And so when you're in your preparation meetings or your grooming meetings or your refinement meetings, you should learn who are the stakeholders and what do they care about. And that's an interesting quality too because that's often time variant. So different stakeholders care about different things at different times. Which I love that because if I just choose the right sprint to put the right story <laughs> The quality factor definition changes. Um, uh, we've been um, in, in software engineering uh, for a short period of history. A short period of history. I think uh, it's about it was the mid 1950s. You can start arguing is when they started doing modern software engineering, and it wasn't very modern until about 1970. And in 1970, it was a bit weird until about 1980. And I think last week, maybe I saw some improvements. It's starting to get a little bit better. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's like eating fish in Zurich. It's very hard to do. <laughs> you know what that story is? I can tell a two-hour story about me trying to eat a fish in this town and people refusing to sell me a fish. Just one fish. I just want one fish. So if you were a civil engineer or an architect, you could reference the book Vitruvius which was written 27 or 25 BC. That's over 2,000 years ago. It's written in ancient Rome. It is a beautiful book. I have the modern English translation for it. I've read it from cover to cover. It uh, talks about quality. It talks about architecture. It talks about civil engineering. It talks about team building. It talks about skill development. It talks about things that matter to get teams of people to collaborate, to get complex projects done. 25 BC, and still actively used and referenced. You want to learn how to make an aqueduct? It's in there. You want to learn how to make an arched frame for a door? It's in there. You want to learn how to position buildings in a city? It's in there. How to do sewage? It's in there. 25 BC. Civil engineers are lucky. They have over 2,000 years of documented practice of which about 2,000 years of it is also evidence gathering and evidence based. We have also our Vitruvius in testing, we're lucky. Our Vitruvius is called The Art of Software Testing. This book was written by Glenford Mayer in 1979 and is often attributed to the first book about testing. I would suggest the first book about test design. There are books that talked about testing before this, but this is the starting point of modern software testing. This is where we look and we start saying, how do we design tests independently of how do we design the system that we're testing? And he comes up with beautiful models, beautiful ways to do it. Even though the technology at the time was very foreign from what we see today, the book is still absolutely relevant to what we do today. I don't suggest you buy it. It's very, very expensive. Uh, but if you ever have a chance to see it, please take a look. It's an amazing book. That's our Vitruvius. So that's what, 1979, what year is it, 2019? What is that, 30 years or 40 years? It's 40 years. We have 40 years of documented evidence-based practice. 
and we're not paying much attention to the evidence. I, I swear, that's, that's a baby. That's a new field. Civil engineering, thousands of years. And when that book was written, the pyramids in Egypt were built 2,000 years before that. So they had a lot of practice. We're just new. We don't have a, a template. We don't have a standard approach. We don't have a sausage machine. We don't have anything in testing. Right now, we're just at the beginning. I guarantee you that every person in this room, every person in this room has got, in their project, a testing situation that is absolutely unique that has different business, technical, organizational, and cultural factors that no one has ever figured out before, and that you are called upon to invent a methodology to solve that problem. And we're, and we're doing that, everyone is doing that in testing today. We have a lot of, uh, of, of evolution still to do. <laughs> it's a new field, and it's exciting. For me, it's super exciting that, that it's a new field. I love, I'm passionate about that, I'm crazy about testing, I love testing. And I love the fact that every problem has so many dimensions that are different, and then if I attack it, I'll probably bring a perspective that's different from you, and, and the two of us will probably synthesize something that will help solve the problem with reasonable cost and help the business do very well. So I'm sort of excited about that. But it's a new field. It's a new field, so be careful about standardizing things. There's a company called Rally. Anyone ever hear of Rally? Rally is a company that makes tools that are sold to agile development teams to track projects. They, they came up with this tool early 2000s, Rally version one. And the tool is a nice tool. I think Jira is probably a bit better, but the, the Rally tool is a nice tool. It's a little bit expensive. It's a lot expensive. It's ridiculously expensive, but it's a tool. And some people <coughs> like it because it's got licensing agreements and SLAs and all this legal stuff. But it's okay, I guess that's important. Uh, but Rally has a feature that is called a testing template. And for every story, what you can do is pull down the testing template and tick off like a menu what your testing activities are. As if we had 2,000 years of evidence-based practice and we could make a generic list like that and we can say, hey, for this story, that's what we've got to do. This is what I call unrealistic testing. This is when people try to say there's a generic solution and for each story we're going to do this, this, and this, and we're going to crank it every time, and that's what we're going to do. And by the way, that's the whole DevOps field. If you look at the chain, they say we can mechanize the chain. And they can mechanize the chain, but the minute one variable or one factor in that chain works, the perturbation, right, is chaotic. Right? One little change, the butterfly flaps its wings and there's a tornado in, in Tokyo or something like that. This happens with people who try to make a perfect, what they call the chain, the, the deployment chain. Because they look at, they don't realize that the chaos is there's things that are happening on the chain that depend on reality. And there's no templates for us. We don't have that in testing. Although the tool vendors create the templates, unfortunately the naive young testers who don't have coaches to help them or guide them and are under a lot of pressure use those tools. So I've actually seen organizations where testers are very proudly showing me their work and they did absolutely no thinking in the planning meeting. They literally pulled down a template from a rally tool, ticked off three things, and waited for the programmer to give them the story, and then they did first thing, second thing, third thing, and they didn't even adapt their testing based on what they learned. I know that what I test next depends on the results of what I tested before. But naive people who follow templates don't know that. They just follow the template. Uh, good coverage message. I'm inspired, of course, as you know, by the work of Edgar Dijkstra. It goes without saying, this is a testing law, right? That testing can show the presence of bugs, but not the absence of bugs. No amount of testing, no amount of testing can show a piece of software is bug-free. It is impossible to demonstrate that by testing. This is reality. The beautiful thing is, that means there's a lot of possible tests. There's an infinite number of possible tests. That's the beautiful thing. The terrible thing is we can't really say something is complete. So when Kent Beck wrote the book, Test Driven Development, and he described test-driven development by saying a developer 
will keep creating unit tests until there's nothing left to test. That's quoting Ken Beck, that's not me. That's the most famous guy in the world of test driven development, whom I respect incredibly. His knowledge of testing and test design is very weak. He's very strong at the programming side. You, you cannot have nothing left to test. I don't think he still says that. What's that? I don't think he still says that. I've got the quote in my ATC course, I'll, I'll be glad to show it to you. He, does, he admits that he's not a test design man. It was in, in Extreme Programming Explained, I believe, the exact quote, but I've got the... No, no, I believe he said that, but it doesn't still... He's no longer saying that. Oh, he's no longer saying that. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, he, exactly. No. And he also is very respectful. I love him to pieces. He also says, I don't understand, like, non-functional testing, and he doesn't understand. He's, he's very mature about that, so you're right. He wrote that in the book, but today he doesn't say that. That's, that's very true. And I don't want to put him down. I love the guy. So I, I want to raise him up. It's the people who practice TD, though, <laughs> that think that you can have complete testing that are, that are missing, I think, the point there. It's never going to be complete. There's always residual risks <laughs> that we have no confidence in whatsoever, if, even if you do good TED. Um, so this is the slide that, that's important. <laughs> this is the only one that matters in the whole deck, so <laughs> if you want to pay attention or take notes, does anyone want to take a picture of this slide? <laughs> Make sure I can stand closer to <laughs> my slide. There we go. Okay, that's the Rob slide. And this is the three things that I, I want to emphasize. In, in Agile teams, it's in the planning meeting where I think you can do this. And it is to say, we should look at the real changes. What did the programmers really change in the code? And we should discuss it. In the planning meeting, they didn't change the code yet. So we can look at what they're planning to change. We can look at the objects, methods, class, stored procedures, process elements, and I urge teams to try to visualize this. I'm a big fan of visual test modeling and test design, and one of the easiest ways to visualize it is with a block diagram, and you draw a block diagram of what's changing, and you discuss the scope and depth of to change. Once you know what's changing, then you can ask questions about, well, I wonder, what features, I wonder what scenarios, I wonder what workflows use the code that's, that's changing, and then you can identify some testing activities to do to shape them down, and frankly, if the risk is too high, then discuss it in the planning meeting, and maybe the developers will figure out another approach which has less risk. Many programmers don't realize that the, the, there's risk, risk, some approaches are more risky than others, so, Discuss it, but that's reality, the real changes. So first thing, what is really changing in the code? Second thing, real usage. Who is the user and what are they doing with the software? So many people today are using Mike Cohen style user stories. Who is the user, what do they want to do and why? And that's a beautiful and very good way to make requirements but it's not the only thing users do with your software. So when I'm, when I'm looking at software, and I'm looking at changing the software, I want to say, well, what's the user's reality? What is, can the user do their job with the software after we make this change? And sometimes this generates interesting testing activity. Sometimes it doesn't, not for every story, but I'm especially concerned about can real users really do their job with the software? So we're modeling what the user does. Can we model what the user does? That's real usage. And the last one is the real world. This is the real environment the software is going to run on. What's the platform it's going to run on? What else is on the system at the same time? That's what is third party co resident software on the platform. Is the platform going to change dynamically? Like, for example, a mobile platform? with that a connection to the internet that changes depending on where you are. These are, these are dynamic changes to the platform. Uh, are, there, are there other elements of it? Network, network bandwidth, CPU saturation, memory use, cache memories. You know about cache memories? Cache memory, there used to be something we studied so hard in testing called the cache hit ratio. And what we tried to do is make sure when the program is running that as much as possible it was using fast memory for processing. And so the cache hit ratio was basically what percentage of the, of the code running was in fast memory. And this then became part of the history of testing when we learned that 
Uh, memory was very cheap, and RAM got faster, so the cache hit ratio didn't matter so much. And so two years ago, I spent several weeks in Mountain View, California at uh, Facebook, and I discovered that one of their most important measures that they look at is cache hit ratios on their servers, and they were able to get significant performance improvements just by shuffling code around in positioning it in memory so that it had less 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 uh, caching, less cache, less less need to go outside of the cache. And this is amazing because that's a very old school testing technique that I saw demonstrated two years ago at Facebook and they got measurable, like literally several percentage improvements in performance just by shuffling code around. And that's what people used to do in the 1970s, by the way. To make code faster, they shuffled it on the disk to make it so that there was less swapping. So it's fun to see that today, in the real world, people are concerned about stuff like that. So what matters? What's the environment we're running on? And is it dynamic and, or static? And by the way, the real world is messy and ugly. All these people who test in clean environments, if you only have two days to test to test, test in the dirtiest, ugliest junkyard you can find. <laughs> Don't test in this clean environment where you can press a button and it resets to a controlled state. The real world is the ugly, yucky, messy, sticky, yuck. <laughs> test there a bit. All right, so that's my fire. People like the fire slide. So I, I pause and I leave it there because I'm supposed to tell a story at this slide. And one of the stories I like to tell is the story of the project which was called the um, Rendezvous Project, it's a medical project. And just to tell you the reality of the project was when it was under development, the teams were trying to use requirement-based software engineering approaches. And the project was failing, and it was actually a death march project, so it was going the wrong way, and if it failed, the whole company would be suffering for many reasons, including legal reasons. Uh, uh, it was very critical that we, we converge the product. Uh, management asked me to take full charge of it. It wasn't my responsibility at the beginning. It became my full responsibility. And I looked at this project and I said, this is ridiculous. There's, there's almost no way we can converge this project if we keep our method, the same method. And there were hundreds of menus and dialogues and controls in the system, and the developers couldn't even make a stable build. Like, you had to build on your desk, you had to build on your desk, but they could, you could never make a build with the two people's code merged together. It was it was like, a, it wasn't just a continuous integration problem, it was a integration problem. And how does that happen? Well, historically, it was because they were taking 200 different builds of a system and trying to create one. 200 different versions of a, of a piece of software and trying to create one. The history of that, uh, I could share with you for another two hours over beer, how it got there, but I'll tell you how I solved the problem it was by knocking on doors. Knock, knock, knock. Customer door. Knock, knock, knock. Customer door. And interviewing customers and learning, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do with our software? What's your job? And after interviewing many, many of the 200 customers, not all, but many, many, I found out that there were only 27 usage scenarios. Hundreds of menus, dialogues, controls, 27 usage scenarios. So I twisted the project around. I said, okay, let's stop trying to get the menus to work. Let's stop trying to get the dialogues and controls to work. And let's see if we can get the scenarios to work. And I hired a bunch of people to work who were experts in the domain. And I worked weekends. They worked two days a week on weekends with me. I hired an expert test consultant manager, George Knopfel, to work with me during the week and weekends. And during the week, I had the developers developing software, continuing to develop, but focusing on the usage scenario. So their job was not to get a feature working, it was to get a scenario working. The testing was scenario-based, but the data was prepared by my expert testing team, which was not doing the testing, but set up the test environments and the test data. Because the domain testers didn't know about test environments and test data, they just know about the domain. We continued this and we were converging, we were able to converge the project on time and save the company. And it's an amazing story. And it was a reality-driven approach that converged the project. The requirements were, were fictitious almost. It was technically easy to do because it's like side-by-side -side software engineering. We have the old version, we have the new version, 
the new version has to do what the old version is, so why should we make requirements? And it's, it's not true. What happens, you should ask the user, what do they do with the old version? Can you do that with the new version? That's not the same question. That's a very different question. So that's a story. Uh, big fan of usage scenarios. So if you're interested in reality, learn about usage scenarios. Identify who the users are and what do they do. And be sensitive to this. Very often, when you don't have much time, these type of tests bubble to the top of priority. Not all usage scenarios, but some usage scenarios bubble up. And if you only have two days to test at the end of the sprint, probably some usage scenarios are a good thing to try. And if they fail, you have a fantastic argument for your product owner. This user can't do this job. <laughs> it's a lot better than saying we have this weird bug here. Um, so that's just a, Pareto helps with this. Are you familiar with Pareto? If you have a transactional system, you can create a histogram of frequency of use of different transactions. And if you sort that by decreasing, uh, so start with the highest frequency and look at the lowest frequency, they have a distribution like that. That's a natural Pareto distribution, which implies that 20% uh, of the transactions happen 80% of the time. And so this is a reality check. This is a reality check. And if you're going to do all this crazy regression testing, the stuff to start with is probably the 20% here, the 20% of the transactions that happen more frequently. So wait, the only way to get this is reality, is to look at the real log files on the real servers and see what's really going on. So, so Pareto is, is reality-driven. Pareto was an Italian economist, by the way, who worked in the 18, late 1800s, and he determined the distribution of wealth. Pareto said 80% of the money is in the hands of 20% of the people. And then in the 1950s, Joseph Duran applied this to engineering in general and process quality control. And this is actually today one of the basis for the group called behavior-driven development. It's, it's interesting how you get all these chain of things together but it's, it's really, you see this in BDD. I, I, I'm not very good at drawing pictures, but I use stick diagrams. You remember UML? Wow, we should sing songs about UML. Bye, bye, this American pie. Uh, UML used to be a great thing. <laughs> then they stopped using it, and now <laughs> the tools are too expensive, but the ideas are still there. And so the diagram here, I use stick figures from UML because I can't draw. And I like to represent uh, usage scenarios in storyboards. This is a storyboard of sharing pictures on Facebook, which I did by interviewing one of their most important users, my granddaughter. <laughs> my granddaughter, when she was 11 years old, I took this to Facebook with me. I showed it to key stakeholders at Facebook, and they got mad at me. I said, Rob, you are a very bad person. And I said, no, no, I'm not bad. I'm good. <laughs> And they said, no, no, you're very bad because 11 year olds are not allowed on Facebook. And I said, oh, my granddaughter's on Facebook and she's 11 years old. And then they said, no, no, she's not allowed. And so I said, what do you do to stop them? We asked them their age. <laughs> so you're right, it's not, it, it's not you that's bad, it's Rob that's bad, obviously. <laughs> it's a true story, man. <laughs> True story. All right, other things. Uh, a reality story from Chicago. Uh, I was in there teaching some test design, just the same course I'm doing today. And uh, the test manager runs into the training room. Rob, we have an emergency. It's a crisis. Help, help. So I went to okay, well, it's your money. <laughs> I'll go help you. So they take me to the war room. They have a war room. With, with dashboards everywhere and charts and all stuff like that. And they said they have a deployed pilot, a deployed release, that's failing all over the place, even though it was very thoroughly tested. So it's deployed, and it's failing everywhere, even though they were very confident in the testing of it. So I talked to them a little bit about the system, and I found out that the type of problems they were having was cross-feature inter interference and they had tested all the features individually very, very well, but they didn't check the inter interactions between them. And this is a classification of testing that dates back to old mainframe systems where they had green screens, and they used to test the screens independently. 
they would almost have like a testing department for like one screen. And the screens were totally independent, and each one had their private database and all this type of stuff. So they weren't actually independent. But with the modern system they were creating, each subsystem had a lot of codependency, and they were using object models that were actually relational databases that, that shared things, and so there was a lot of interdependence between the screens, so they didn't test for that. So once I realized that, I said, well, we've got to try to test you know, multiple things in combination. So they said, oh, great. We think we can do that, because we've got some automation tools. So we think we can do that. So they, they, they basically showed me that to get to a screen, there were three controls. One had five options, one had six options, one had two options. And every combination of, of these three controls went to a different screen. So how many possible screens were there? 60, right, exactly. So this, the type of math I use is not not too complicated, but it's 60. And sure enough, there's 60 screens. So to exercise each combination once would require 60 tests, I guess. But they said that they would want to try all possible screens in every possible order at least once. So if you want to, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you want to do that, you basically have a testing problem like this, where you're trying to figure out the number of permutations of 60 objects. Now, maybe it's ill-formed. They weren't very clear in their mathematical statement, but trust me, they wanted to do all these 60, permutations, 60 object permutations. So that's easy, I said, that's easy to calculate. All we have to do is figure out what is 60 factorial. And we know that's equal to 60 times 59 times 58 times dot, 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 three, two, one. And with some help from Excel, we find that it's approximately equal to 8.32 times 10 to the 81. And they said, yay, we have automation tools. This is going to help us. <laughs> and I said, yeah, are they from HP or? <laughs> I don't know what, what drug you're taking here, but then, that's a big number, I said. And I wanted to tell them about this number. I had to talk to them about the American space program. And I, I love to go to places like Cocoa Beach. And if you want to spend some time there, there's a wonderful testing conference coming up there in August called CAST. And it's right near Nassau, this testing conference. When you go to NASA and you see the Space Center there, you actually meet NASA physicists. And I met them and I talked to them. And one of the first times I went there, there was this display about the Space Telescope, right? The big, big Space Telescope. And, and the, this telescope, basically, they said to me, it can observe a large part of the visible universe. Not the whole universe, the visible universe. And they calculated that the visible universe, visible from the space telescope, is between 10 to the 79 and 10 to the 82 atoms. So my customer in Chicago wanted to do more tests than the lower bound of the number of atoms in the visible universe. This is true. This really happened in Chicago with CNA Insurance. They published about this. this is an amazing story. So they believed me finally when they said the automation's not going to help very much. <laughs> and instead, I think maybe we have to do some sort of reality check here. Do we have users? Yes. <laughs> do they have workflows? Yes. Does anybody know about the workflows? Anybody here know about the workflows? Guess what? They had a training department. And the training department had spent all the time while they're developing this new system modeling the workflows of the new system so they could train all the employees to use it. And they had beautiful, hello, diagrams of the workflow like this, flow charts like this. And so when I saw this, I said, okay, I can create something called a control flow diagram. So what I did was I made this. This is a digital picture of the actual control flow diagram of the Chicago system. This is, this is actually done live and by hand by me under pressure, right? So it's, it's crazy. You see the mistake in it? I don't know if you can see the R where it is. It's way up high there. The R should be low and it's planar, which is healthy. It's a healthy topology, planar topology. And I computed that with this, with this uh, method of analysis, that there were actually, uh, a, it's a possibility of testing this with 22 test cases that would very thoroughly test 
the, the paths that mattered in the system. And this is, is it's a, a plan application of McCabe's complexity analysis. And I did this by hand. And I came up with these 22 test cases. It took CNA insurance three weeks to implement these test cases. Because every time they implemented this, they had to create the test data and the test transaction that went through this particular path. And guess what? They found fantastic bugs. And they had to fix the bugs. And they couldn't go from path one to path two unless they got path one working. And after these three weeks, they got the 22 paths working. They reinitiated the pilot. And they were able to go commercial with no additional software engineering rework. That is reality-driven testing. It's not a myth. It's not a fantasy. It's looking at, can real people do their real work with the real system with real workflow? And then going and tackling it with a rich collection of test design expertise so you can choose the uh, best test design for the best problem space. And that's what I did. And it's a beautiful example. And I sort of love that story. I want to talk about one more type of reality. I know that I'm taking all of your time here. And was there, did I see a glass of wine earlier? <laughs> is there wine here or is it only <clears throat> beer? There's no wine in Switzerland? No, no, see, you want to hear the story. <laughs> you, know, you know where some wine is hidden? Aha, you're my you buddy here. I'll cut the filming of this little part. Anne will kill me about the joke about the wine. When you edit the film, if you make oh, it. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Anne doesn't need to repeat it. No, no, no. Cockpits repeat in German. Lips that touch wine will never touch mine. <laughs> so failure modes. Let's look at the reality of what's changing in a system and ask the question, what can break? <laughs> what can break? And failure mode testing is challenging a system by looking at it. We can create block diagrams like this showing the process elements of a system and the relationship between them. So you have process elements and the relationship between them. And when you look at this picture, in a planning meeting, the programmers can tell you for a story which boxes they're thinking of changing and how much change are they going to do. In fact, I like to suggest that some boxes are going to have lights changing, some boxes are going to be completely refactored, some boxes are going to have medium type of changing, and then some boxes will be removed and replaced. So, so you can actually qualify about four or five different levels of change for each of these boxes. And then you can look and say, well, that, does that necessitate a failure mode analysis? Failure mode analysis asks for each object, what if the object fails during a transaction? What if the object is not visible? What if the object is busy? What if there's something wrong with the object during the transaction? And so to do the failure mode test, what you do is you simulate the failure of the object that matters and try to do a usage scenario that depends on that object. And people build charts like this this is part of a failure mode analysis. And you'll see the columns on the top represent all the process, all the blue boxes are the process elements on the top. By the way, the yellow boxes are out of scope. Your project always has some boxes that are out of scope. The blue boxes are in scope. And the top down on the left is a list of the usage scenarios, like the mind map I showed you at the beginning of the thing. So now we see. What if a process fails the relationship between usage scenarios and boxes? So if you look at something like this, unloader box chocolate scenario, and you say here S1, which is for us a high severity issue, so the controller box. So if we're changing the controller box during the sprint, we probably want to do a failure mode test which checks, simulates the controller fail while you're trying to do this usage scenario. You don't just simulate the failure. You simulate the failure while you're doing the scenario that depends on the failure to make sure that you recover properly, that you get reasonable error conditions, and that you don't lose data or business because of the failure. So, in, in, so that's failure mode analysis. Uh, do you have time to do a failure mode analysis in two days at the end of a sprint? No. What you do is in the planning meeting when you're discussing the stories, Look at what's changing in your block diagram and have a knowledge of use scenarios that might relate to that. So you do a microscopic one in the planning meeting to identify the testing activities. That's, that's what you do. You don't 
flow and do a failure mode and effects analysis. But there's something really cool in North America. I don't know if it's true in Europe, but if you say that you're doing a failure mode and effect analysis, your management gets really excited. Because this is very popular. They love failure modes and effect analysis. I don't know why. They probably teach it at Harvard Business School and they use it in the automobile industry. I don't know why. But that type of analysis is actually respected by non-technical executive stakeholders. And there's books written about this method. I mean, it's not software books. It's about assessing failures and simulating failures and seeing what the impact of a failure is. And sometimes that's what we got to do in our testing. Um, we should consider when we're looking for testing ideas, things beyond the requirements. These are just sources. Who's paying for the software? Who's supposed to use the software? What problem is the software solving? Does the software have to run before or after or during operation? Will unrelated software be running at the same time? You get dozens of these questions. Data sharing, process resource sharing, users doing different things. Uh, some users are novice, some users are familiar, some users are, are unfamiliar with the system, novice experts, typical users, different categories, others installing people, <coughs> configuration management, data management, where does the data come from, where does the data go to. All of these are things to look at that have nothing to do with the statement of the story, but have to do with the realities of the operations of the system. And these become sources of interesting testing ideas. Don't forget non-functional testing. Just because non-functional testing is hard to do in a sprint doesn't mean that we don't have to consider it. It may be important. And there's you know, localization issues and stuff like that. I don't, you know, take me two hours to go through all that list. There's more lists like that in my extra material. If you want a copy of it, you can send me an email, as I said, at rockside at gmail.com. I'm honored to share all my stuff with the community here. And I thank you for welcoming me and listening to me. And I'm open for question and dialogue about the reality of German testing stuff now. Maybe you can facilitate the yeah, well, it's uh, not everyone that's in the The person in the back on the left, is there a question there? No? I'm making it up. There's no question. You have to Oh, I'll have a glass after. Thank you. Now? Sure, if you want. The source. <clears throat> yeah, since nobody's asking, I didn't have. I have a dilemma or a contradiction that I cannot solve, which is the same. Um, so you mentioned DevOps and that triggered me. Uh, I also hate the term, uh, but I do think that uh, agility is rather that uh, you can measure this uh, if they are able to really fast deploy anything. And, and uh, on the one side, uh, there are people that say, look, Google email or Gmail, it's, it's always deployed. So there is no, not even sprints, right? It's always, always deployed continuously. And, and, and on the other hand, uh, I, I actually value spend up in testing. That's the most valuable testing for me. And I cannot see how this combines. So how, how is it possible to really do uh, the, the, the creative testing and still having uh, this, this, this one pipeline that's always pushing? Well, I, I have seen cases which are very successful and I have seen cases that are very weak. Um, a deployment pipeline that is built on software that truly follows what's called a RESTful API model, a REST API model, where the functionality is truly independent and the state is really moved in the packet, what they call the payload, then the interdependence of features is almost zero. And so there's many risks from my reality thing that would hardly ever show up. And so you can do that with great confidence. And I think Google is exemplary in that. If you study the Google APIs, you'll see that they're very orthogonal and very well, well managed and well structured. And because of that, they, they minimize cross feature interference and certain types of risks that I don't think, I, I think they'd be less evident 
and they can do better deployments. So I think that still in teams, when, when you're developing software, you should consider what are the proper activities to do to create the code and to make sure that the code works. So this is testing type of activities and programming activities. And from that set, you should consider a rich set, not just the statement of the requirement. And the people that I know who do testing at Google are not independent testers, but they're, they're very test savvy people. And they don't just test the code that they write, they do test it to make sure it does things that, that matter to, to the community of users. But they take huge risks at Google too. And they don't care about regression in a lot of cases. Uh, they don't have to, and they don't. So, it, you know, they, 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 I mean, I spent uh, two days with the person responsible for the design of the Gmail desktop. Two days with this guy. And I, I, afterwards, I was ready to leave. Like, I can't stand it. The, his philosophy was so technically oriented, and he wanted to deploy solutions which use the latest and greatest technology so fast that he didn't care about backward compatibility from the point of view of an end user. And my mother was an end user of Gmail, who because of an update that was pushed on everybody, stopped having the ability to use email. She was 89 years old, and she had memorized where to click this, where to click that, and all this click pattern stuff, and Google went to a complete object, or object, uh, object recognition model for the user interface for Google Docs and Gmail, and they just didn't care. So, so Google, if you don't care about regression compatibility at a user level, you can get away with a lot. Google Mail works, it's very good, it's very reliable, but it's not for everybody. If you want backward compatibility guaranteed, <laughs> you're not gonna get it from them. And so they don't care about risks like that. But they do care about data risks, and they do tons of, like, tons of data, like simulating sending millions of, of messages, and they're very good at that. So I don't know, I, I mean, I like that the architectures help us reduce the risk, so if the architectures are conducive to using technologies, we were just talking on the way here about how Docker can help with this type of thing, by encapsulating environments, and you're reducing environment risk that way, and if you use the RESTful APIs, you reduce cross-feature cross interference risks, so I think that in, in terms of a DevOps continuous push mode, there's ways to get the, the risks more controlled, but they're still they're there. So you still have to do somewhere a deliberate planning of what are we technically gonna change, and then we should look at that and say, well, what's our risk? And look at the three reality things, what's being changed, what's the environment's gonna be in, and how are people gonna use it? If you don't care about how people use it, and the environment is under control, then the only risks are based on what's the real technical change. And that's possibly more manageable in a DevOps push thing. I, but uh, the, the, you know, when I look at uh, how people practice DevOps, everyone seems to do it very, very differently. And there's some people who are very, very good at it, or some people say they're very good at it, and you look at it, and every fifth build, the whole system crashes. And they, their build environments are unstable. And that's because they're trusting automated frameworks that don't check for some, some risk. So, I think that you're right to question it. It's, it's hard to fit in testing. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's hard to fit in testing if your pipeline is tight. But I believe that a lot of DevOps stuff is very optimistic and they're forgetting the chaos. There's, there's a risk that one perturbation somewhere can throw the whole thing off. And so when they find that, they're supposed to fix it, correct it, and do a process improvement so that it minimizes in the future. But do the DevOps teams really do retrospectives like frequently? I don't know. It's, it's not like a scrum team in development. It's sort of much more fluid than that. But we're getting there. The software is doing less and less stuff. And if the software does less and less stuff, and you know how to test that very, very well, you, you'll be able to get to that level of confidence. I still believe you should do reality-based testing, but it doesn't have to take five weeks. It could take a half an hour. You know, that, if I have good tools, good simulation, the right type of automation, as long as I think it through and study it, I'm, it doesn't have to take many days, but it, it's something I still want to do it. And I want to encourage people to, to do it. Thanks. Yeah, that's, it's a tough question, though. It's the right question. Thank you very much. Yes?
When, when, when did work is over? Get that out, Jane? Wow. Um, when it doesn't work, it's over. I don't really have a story I can share, but I have access to stories I can share. And if I can defer this to uh, 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 maybe you wait for an email or something, I, I want to build a, a, a collection of, of stories like that. I do know a company that's totally in the DevOps business, and they shared with me an example where they had a distributed team where every single person was like working virtually on a project, and they said that they failed dismally, that they weren't able to get it working, and a part of it was because of the, the fact that it was distributed. No one ever actually met together. They, were, they had false impressions of what other people were doing and stuff like that. Uh, but I don't have that documented. But I'm happy to chase that down. I don't know, is there a vehicle to share that type of thing here, Ilya? Yes, uh, I can just put it on meetup.com. Yeah. So it's got all the participants here. If but it's, it's certainly, this, certainly for me, that's an activity that I would be able to do in the January. I, I have, um, my McGill semester is January, February, March, and I like to build and collect my case studies in January. And I think a failure of the DevOps case study on that is a good, is a good one. I don't have an example in my collection yet, but I can certainly find and document some. I just don't have one to share right now. And in the GitHub document uh, downtime, uh, do you carry a kind of public list of uh, failures and failures? <laughs> well, I'm sure there's failures. I, 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 I just don't have the story to share. And I, I like to know when I tell the story what happened and sometimes why it happened. Or, or why we, or how we can avoid it in the future, and so that's the right question. I don't have, I don't have an uh, example. Sure, good one. All right, I would propose that we uh, just go over to the social part of the evening. Um, uh, Rob uh, is still here.